Okay, so I'm going to start by giving a very basic introduction to what it is that I'm trying to do. And uh, um, the uh, problem that uh, I've been trying to solve from a variety of different perspectives is to understand what the sources of knowledge that speakers need and use to uh, assess the acceptability of a phonological string. Uh, and um, the easiest form of phonological string that we can deal with is a word. So this will mostly be the acceptability of words. So uh, um, the uh, kind of most simple version of an acceptability judgment of a word is to ask someone how possible does the following sound as a word in your language? How possible, so if you ask an English speaker, how possible does stin sound as a word in English? They might say, oh, that could have been a word. Uh, if you ask how possible is black, they're not likely to like it all that much. If you ask zik or lubak, um, completely out of the question. Okay. So um, I will focus here mostly on this intuition, the ability to rate the acceptability of a word. But um, the acceptability of uh, phonological strings has been shown to play a role in many other kinds of online tasks, including uh, repetition accuracy, uh, decision speeds of various types, lexical um, decisions, and so on. Um, identification of phonemes, likelihood of change. When you borrow a word, you're more likely to change back uh, than you are to change stin if you happen to borrow it. So that is the phenomenon, to understand um, what people draw on to uh, make these kinds of judgments. And for a long time, phonological theory has thought it had an answer to this problem. Um, so uh, these kinds of judgments about the acceptability of words have long been um, called grammaticality judgments, and uh, simply treated as direct uh, access to an object, the grammar, which gives you an answer, is it grammatical or not? Um, so uh, the famous example of uh, the hypothetical English word lick being uh, more acceptable than benick is taken as evidence that clusters like benut are not legal in English, and therefore the grammar of English must rule them out. Okay. What could be easier? Uh, other examples that are perhaps a little bit more interesting than lick and benick, um, a study by Scholes that we'll look at a little bit more in a bit, um, showed that English speakers preferred mrum over mlum. I mean, over mrum, sorry. Uh, they preferred mrum over mrum. Now, mra and nra are both illegal in English, but uh, nra does indeed have a problem which is worse than mra. It has the um, N and the R at the same place of articulation, and that would uh, potentially be interesting evidence for a constraint against uh, having two different um, uh, consonants with the same place of articulation. There's other pieces of evidence, like the fact that there's no tula with the D and the L, or um, fwa with the B and the wa. Um, okay, so that's where um, phonological theory wanted to be, and simply uh, took the evidence at face value, but um, it's not really that easy. I mean, there are a lot of different possible mechanisms people really could be using to make this decision, and we can't be naive to that. And uh, some of the sources of knowledge that people have that allow them to make this decision um, may well have something to do with grammar, but many of them may not. So uh, the two likely candidates for non-grammatical sources of uh, influence on acceptability um, are what I will call a little bit contentiously um, processing considerations. Uh, so the first is um, simply the surface probability of the string of perceptual categories. You hear a word nick, it has a but and a nut and an it. And if your model of perception is one in which uh, you have a perceptual category but that you hear in the speech stream and a nut, you may calculate probabilities over combinations of uh, um, sequences, and this is um, often thought to be a very early, kind of shallow sort of processing over um, perceived uh, um, categories, which can be used for um, tasks like dividing the strength of the stream into words, um, recognizing those words, and so on. So this is not a kind of grammatical processing, this is just assessing the um, likelihood, the probability of the sequence of sounds you're hearing. And that's what I mean by a processing consideration, this is sort of a surface um, uh, shallow uh, processing over perceptual categories. The other factor that uh, um, is known to influence the acceptability of a word is the number of phonological neighbors it has, words that differ from it by just a limited number of changes or uh, overlap substantially with the word. In this case, lick has a neighbor brick, and it has lick and a number of other neighbors or close to neighbors, whereas nick, it also has a neighbor brick, but it doesn't have a neighbor flip. <laughs> um, it has fewer neighbors. And uh, it could be that uh, the overlap that Lick has with all of the blow words may be important.
important just in a lexical competition. So in the course of hearing someone say blick, you try to recognize it as a word, and if you get fooled for a minute into thinking it could be a word, the longer you're fooled, the more it sounds like a word. So that would be an easy line of explanation too. So these are uh, really sort of incontrovertible lines of reasoning that uh, people might uh, use. And these are um, simple statistical properties of phoneme com combinations and uh, could be uh, just used as heuristics to facilitate processing. And if all of the uh, difference between blick and bnick could be reduced to these things, we would have no evidence for grammar at all from uh, acceptability judgments. OK. Um, of course, it is logically possible that there is nonetheless a separate grammatical evaluation. Um, and I will assume for present purposes that grammar consists of constraints on representations. And in phonology, representations, I will assume, consist of sequences of feature specifications. So a constraint on feature specifications might be something like don't have a sound which is non-strident, so don't have a consonant other than S or SH before a nasal sound. Uh, some are okay, but other <coughs> consonants are not okay before N. Or, or it might be something about having the place combination that's in ra or in la. Um, and uh, a body of these grammatical constraints, which are set loose on the phonological representation, could uh, then deliver an acceptability or grammaticality, uh, if, let's say a grammaticality um, score to the word, which would influence the acceptability. Um, some interesting features of grammatical constraints, in addition to the fact that they are uh, defined over phonological structures, are that there are many ingredients to grammar that have been argued on various other grounds, like explaining linguistic typology, to uh, be particular to grammar and uh, not something learnable from any individual language. One of them is a uh, preference for particular uh, phonological structures over others, and this may be purely arbitrary, just a arbitrary feature of the phonological module, that it hates certain things. Um, most languages of the world don't like words starting with nga. It's not completely obvious why words should not start with nga, but it's a very strong constraint. And that might be something arbitrary about human language. It might have a perceptual basis. Um, certainly those of us who speak languages without nga have a hard time saying it and perceiving it. Uh, that's not quite enough to prove that it's hard to say and to perceive, but um, there might be something uh, hard to say or perceive about it. Um, and so uh, one other place then that we might expect to see the hallmark of uh, some uh, non-statistical mechanism is if we can find evidence for uh, these kinds of biases that have to do with the phonological system. And the last is if we can see uh, limitations on the computations, the statistical computations that the, that the system can perform. Um, and uh, so what I'm uh, going to do is try to uh, show you little pieces of evidence for, along all of these lines to show you that I think it's possible to peer through the acceptability ratings, the numbers people give you, and find evidence that, in fact, all of these things are at play. Okay, so the question we want to ask is whether we need grammar at all to explain these preferences. I'm going to argue that the answer is yes. And uh, the more interesting question that we really want to attack here is uh, how we use uh, these preferences to actually learn something about the nature of that grammar. Okay, so how do we use the, the, the preferences people have to uh, discover what the grammar of English is that they use? Okay, so I'm, as I say, I'm going to present some sources of evidence that uh, we uh, can find that there is a distinct role for grammar in determining phonotypic acceptability. And this will uh, fall into these three groups, uh, that we can find a role for uh, phonological representations in the form of features, that we can find an influence of phonetic biases, uh, in particular in the cluster, plus the way that uh, sounds have to be ordered in consonant clusters, and that we get uh, disproportionate penalties for rare or marginal combinations. And we'll come back to what that means later. OK, but the uh, recipe for each of these cases is that we uh, um, first see what the uh, statistical properties of English would predict. We find that acceptability judgments deviate from the statistics of English. We look for a reason why they would deviate and try to model it using a grammatical model that incorporates some piece of grammar. And uh, along the way, hopefully, we gain some insight into the form the grammar has to take in order to do its work. Okay, and I should say up front that I have just spent 
several minutes now saying grammar, 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 and we find the evidence for grammar. My concern here is not to pit statistical knowledge and grammatical knowledge against each other. Um, and we'll actually see that the two overlap quite considerably. Um, what I'm really focusing on here are the kinds of structure and the kinds of knowledge and the kinds of biases that people bring to the task of learning their language. I don't particularly want to get into a uh, border dispute about, you know, is this a principle of grammar or is it something right outside of grammar? Um, that I don't care so much about. We're interested in what it is that people are doing to, um, and what is revealed by their intuitions. Okay, so we need somewhere to start. And uh, a good place to start is with the simplest possible model. Um, this uh, may be familiar to some of you, but I don't um, assume it, so I thought I would uh, start by being very explicit. Um, a very common model of the surface phonotactic probability that's often used to segment the stream into words or to uh, um, influence uh, phoneme identification and so on, is to simply look at the transitional probability from one phoneme to the next, meaning if the word that is lick, the probability that a word would start with ba, that after ba you get an o, that after you get an i, and so on. And the probability of the word is simply the joint probability, the product of all of those probabilities. Okay, that's the baseline. Um, now, uh, this ha has proven to be a very successful model of a number of um, interesting differences in the processing so uh, um, phoneme identification, if you hear something which is in between tra and sla, you might have a certain cutoff between r and l where you um, kind of, uh, at one side of it you hear it as r and the other side you hear it as l, but if you put it in the context of t, where the probability of l after t is very low, you're less likely to hear the l and you get pushed to the r. So that would be uh, um, the uh, transitional probability in play. And uh, this has been argued to uh, also provide a pretty good uh, model of uh, non scores So if we just calculate this, we'll get um, a score for Blick, and that will be a pretty good model. And to show you that, um, we start first with a uh, comparison, which um, is pretty clear. I think as a native speaker of English, I'm pretty sure that stin sounds more plausible than blake. You have to think about it for a minute, but uh, late is a little bit funny. Not that funny, but a little funny. Uh, Stim sounds better than late, and it turns out that experimental subjects always agree. And, uh, it, and when you calculate the probabilities of the, um, the transitional probabilities of each of the um, bicones, the combinations of two segments, it comes out in that direction. So the, uh, the probability, the log probability of uh, late is lower than the log probability of Stim. And uh, there have been a number of papers that have uh, used, um, in one form or another, these transitional probabilities to predict well harmonious of words. So um, we, too, want to use this as a baseline. And so in order to um, be able to compare the performance of other models, I'll start by uh, showing you how well this does on some data I have available to uh, analyze. So I took a set of um, 88 words that I had used in a, a, as verbs in a study of English past tense formation. We don't care here that they're verbs, um, but in a pretest, uh, in order to norm for phonotactic acceptability, we asked subjects how acceptable they were. So this is words like sin, or like lake. Um, it included a bunch of these pretty good words, grit, pink, sin, uh, intermediate words like sire and lake, um, some rather odd words like quads and bricks and schmooz and skip. Uh, these have, uh, in some cases, some uh, violations that are not strictly vocal, the K and the K and the skip. Um, but uh, for the most part, they just involve strange combinations like oik or schwat. Okay, so that just gives a range of different kinds of words to test. And so I, uh, so these words were played um, auditorily to subjects, and they pushed a button from one to seven. And that's how plausible it sounded as an English word to them. And so then I calculated the uh, transitional probabilities, the, and um, I took the product. And uh, for every word, then we see that there is a predicted log probability, and it's plotted against the mean rating, and it's not bad. Um, this captures quite a bit of uh, what goes into people's um, ratings of these words. So that's a pretty good baseline. And this is the kind of result that has uh, um, made it to press as reasons why we believe that um, bigram transitional probabilities are a good model of 
when I talk to acceptability. But there's more. <laughs> we can do better. So uh, there's one really obvious place where a uh, bigram, uh, where bicone um, probability cannot do the job for us. Uh, so another systematic preference, which I didn't show you explicitly in there, but um, was seen in uh, some pieces of that, and we'll see more of it below, is uh, a preference for um, words like quack over words like knack. Knack is a nick word. Uh, over words like black or bzak. Um, all of those uh, combinations, wa, na, da, and za, are unattested in English words. And here I have to say this is unless you live in California where the word um, bueno is sometimes found. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, um, so the common, uh, but nonetheless, even in California, there are no place names uh, or that. Um, so if, unless you happen to have grown up with a chemist father who says helium a lot, you uh, have never heard any uh, word uh, duck. And uh, the, um, uh, and so there's no way on the basis of simply the uh, transitional probabilities to differentiate these words. It's always zero after the D. So uh, this uh, is shown in, uh, Full detail there, uh, as you see. Um, uh, so if you uh, all, if you just took the frequency word initially, they would all be zero. If you said, well, maybe people are uh, also interested in how often "na" occurs in the middle of words, in words like "abner" uh, or something, and maybe that makes "na" sound a little better. Maybe there are more words like "abner" than there are words like "abdicate." Um, <laughs> turns out, no, it's the other way around. There's more "da" words than there are "na" words. So uh, here I showed if you even take the medial probability into account, it doesn't that at all. Okay. So um, how do we uh, model preferences among unattested forms, uh, unattested strings? Well, the uh, standard answer to this in phonological theory is people use features. Um, so they, it's not just that they're considering no, they're considering a cluster of consonants which have particular um, features to them. and. Uh, um, they uh, know what the uh, more they know what the better combinations are. Uh, this uh, um, point was uh, proven beautifully by Morris Howley in his paper um, "Knowledge uh, Unlearned and Untaught." I think that's what it's called. So that uh, um, uh, points out that if uh, the word "bach" is given to English speakers, and they can, if if you find speakers who can pronounce it, they'll produce the plural as "bachs," not "bachs" or "bachas." So they have to know what dimension to uh, um, generalize the English plural uh, LMRP on. And they know that what's relevant is that it ends in something that's voiceless, the ch. Um, that sounds kind of easy, but it's not really completely trivial, because in fact, ch also shares some properties in common with sa and sh. So they could have used features to generalize to uh, produce machas as well, depending on what you assume as the features of the sounds. Um, and so what this really shows is not just that features are the answer, but that we need a way to figure out what the evidence of the language is telling us with respect to the feature combinations that are possible in the language. So the uh, box example shows that a feature is used, um, and now we need to know how to pick the feature combinations. Um, the parallel in uh, phonotactics is the uh, comparison between la and na, um, where uh, just like the existence of and and ka give you some evidence about ba, the existence of la and ra and sna might provide some evidence about na. Might. And the question is how? Uh, so there are two possible ways that one could look at the set of occurring forms and decide what, what, what they had in common that was crucial to allow them and uh, whether that should also allow them. No. Um, one way would be to simply um, compare the features that each of the things have in common. So comparing what a B and an S have in common and comparing what an R and an N have in common. It turns out that uh, um, this is not crucial to um, understand exactly what the candidates were for this, but it turns out that the uh, only thing that B and S have in common is a set of features that also a number of other things, like P and T and so on, have in common. Um, and the only thing that R and N have in common is a set of things that also, uh, well, 
I guess it depends what you believe the features are, but something that also things like L and W and so on have in common too. So both of these uh, are about um, particular a combination of particular types of sounds. It's also logically possible that speakers might um, take a more narrow comparison between bra and gla and say, well, gla and bra have something in common which, although N isn't a member of the set, it does have things in common too. So to extrapolate from the set of um, tested examples. So those are both logically possible ways of doing it. And so what we want to do is uh, then devise a model that can compare the attested sound combinations, say that I have a bug here and a sid there, and uh, see what they have in common, uh, and use that to assess the likelihood of other sounds which might belong to members of the same set. So we're going to have to uh, evaluate the support for a particular class of segments. So given that you have R and L, what is the support for N? Or given that you have R and N, what is the support for N? <laughs> um, and uh, um, weight the um, different hypotheses. So what I'm going to use here is an approach that I've developed with Bruce Hayes um, that we call minimal generalization because the model sticks as close to the data as possible. Um, so suppose the uh, learner had been given just a minimal pair of blue and brew and had to learn what was in common or what was a legal word of the language. Well, we know that words can start with but and they can have a sound like blah or rut after it and then they can have an ooh. That's about as minimal as it gets. Um, now, if you've then got another form of brew, then you learn that, well, you can have not just but, but also buzz, also does, and it turns out that the tightest way to characterize those also predicts does should be possible. Um, and uh, you still have all of So the uh, learner then um, uh, compares the pairs of forms that it has and extracts what they have in common by uh, figuring out what these shared feature values are between L and R, between P and G, and ditching the other feature values. Okay, that is um, conceptually easy, but it's not um, obvious what you need to compare with what. So if you compare blue and grew, those words tell you what you should compare about them. <laughs> but words don't always tell you that. So if you have the form bla and spa, what should you compare with what in bla and spa? There are uh, various different ways of doing it, but if you didn't have any particular strategy, you might just line them up and say, I'm going to compare the D with the S and the L with the P. And that will tell me that I can have anything in that class, which is quite a large set of possible segments, and anything in that has both of those, which is an even bigger set of segments. Um, I didn't list every single thing there. So if you just compare bot and spot, you might start down a path of saying, great, I can have any two consonants. Um, so uh, that would be bad. <laughs> Uh, in fact, there's a lot of support in English for combinations of two consonants. So if you thought, I can have two consonants, you're going to start hearing your hypothesis confirmed quite a bit from then on out. Uh, um, uh, but um, it is not the case that every possible combination is good. And you don't want, the, you don't want to predict that a combination like that is going to be acceptable. Um, however, if we just took the blend spoke comparison at face value, we might end up in that situation. Do we? Yeah. Just a little food for the furniture. <laughs> so, okay, so the challenge then is to find a way to evaluate the uh, evidence over natural classes so that uh, comparing blood and bruh can give you some support for blood, even though it's outside of the feature space that um, they have in common, whereas uh, comparisons like blood and spud can't generalize to that even though it's inside the space of things that they have in common. So that is the uh, task. And there are a variety of different uh, ways to do this. Um, the intuition is that we want to um, come up with feature characterizations that stick as close to the data as possible. And if we uh, look at the comparison um, now switching to before Ws, the existence of what and what, they're rare, but they occur in English. Um, and then uh, consider the hypothesis that what might also occur. That's not a very big leap. And the reason it's not a very big leap is that the uh, combination of features that you could have one of the sounds but a good followed by a what um, almost already tells you you have what. 
I mean, essentially, uh, there's only one variable here that's free about this combination. And uh, if you just say it's a labial, then you will have the blood. Whereas if your hypothesis was that this is the blood and spot comparison, that these kind of constant-consonant combinations were possible, this doesn't tell you much about the duck. It just tells you you can get combinations of consonants. So you have to fill in a lot to get the duck. So we can um, cast this as a problem of likelihood uh, maximization, where uh, we um, say that the uh, set of, so the wa and uh, wa and wa combination um, describes a small set of possible sequences, and therefore means that the probability of any one sequence in there is pretty high. So if you just know that this, these combinations are possible, and then you start speaking, one third of the time you'll say wa, one third of the time you'll say wa, one third of the time you'll say wa. And your actual words will uh, be very likely then, because your words will have the was and the was at least. Whereas if your uh, hypothesis was that this combination was possible, and you just start generating words with those combinations, you're un very unlikely to hit on actual words of English. Because uh, there are so many combinations in there that don't actually occur. So uh, the chances that, so this uh, combination makes the chance of actually occurring, uh, of actually encountering the real English words much higher than that one. Let me say this a slightly different way. The goal is to find those descriptions that make the data of English as likely as possible. We don't want to leave it to chance that the word that started with um, what started with what. Um, and this is related to a whole variety of different um, uh, uh, strategies, uh, both in um, learning phonology and in learning more generally, that attempts to find um, the right level of specificity of analysis to uh, um, characterize the data set um, as possible. Um, so I uh, hooked up a little model to do this, um, and uh, uh, it works as follows. So it starts with the idea of the simple bigram model, which I already showed you. So, uh, um, well, I showed you a variant of uh, so it's, uh, a model in which the um, probability of a particular sequence is the number of times it occurs over the number of sequences, so that's just the probability of that sequence. But now we have to take into account that uh, we have uh, sequences of natural classes. And we want to think about the probability not only of that combination, but of the particular members that you have. So we want to know not just the probability of a but or a and what, but we want to use that to estimate the actual probability of what. So what we can do is say that uh, if we have a class, uh, then uh, we want to take the probability of a sequence AB as the probability of that class times the probability of choosing the individual members from the class. So I simply build in an extra um, cost for uh, instantiating each of the members of the class. Okay, this is actually a little clearer. No. Yes, here. So the uh, probability of what using the uh, gut and what is that prob the probability of this uh, combination of natural classes over the probability of all natural classes times the probability of choosing B as a voice to stop and what is your W. Um, so, uh, the, uh, so this says, I want to know, you know what is the probability that I could use this to actually get a what, and it's what the probability of getting that and the probability of getting the what from among that. So we've just broken it down into uh, getting the class and getting the numbers of the class. Uh, we could calculate the probability of what using this much more general almost any consonant, almost any consonant combination. And here, that's a very high probability, but the probability of getting B from among that class and W from among that class is quite low. Okay. So uh, then um, the, each surface string is ambiguous with respect to what natural classes it uh, embodies, and the um, a uh, way of uh, dealing with this ambiguity is to let the uh, model parse each string into the best combination of natural classes that it can find. So given the choice between treating what as a combination of stop and what, and treating what as a combination of two consonants, we're more likely to treat it as a stop and what, because we know that there's a, a, a so assuming that the probabilities are higher that way. So, um, Boa finds good support from this, and uh, um, wouldn't find his good support from this. However, duh, there are no such close 
so Dwa and Gua created this guy for Gua to get sheltered in on. Um, da has no friends. There was nothing that was really close to Da that is a similar specific thing. It has to resort to something like this. Maybe not this precisely, but something like this. And so this uh, is going to uh, make the uh, likelihood of Da much less. OK, so this was um, a bit of work, but it uh, gives us a way that we can explore sequences of natural classes um, and uh, their um, relative support from the data to uh, give us a predicted number for the likelihood of a word um, by parsing it into the natural classes that it instantiates. OK, so I uh, trained that model on the same um, training set that I used for the bigrams. And got the predictions with the same set of words, and it doesn't look that different. <laughs> That's uh, possibly good, because it started out looking already pretty good. Um, there might be a limit to how well we can actually do with this data. Um, so it, uh, in order to probe this a little bit more, what I did was, I mean, what we really want to know is did the features add anything to this endeavor, or did we just do a lot of work to um, lose to the bigram model? So what I did was I uh, took nested models in which we test for all of the other factors that we might hypothesize are relevant, and then add the feature model or not, and compare whether the model gets better when we add the feature model. And uh, so um, I added a bunch of potential predictors here. I added also neighborhood density, and I added a, neighborhood, I added a version of neighborhood density um, proposed by Bailey and Ahn, which is a little bit more sophisticated way of doing it. Um, I added the segment-based bigram probability, and now we just see, do the features add anything? And the answer is yes. There's a highly significant contribution of the features. So even though the net result of just using the features looks rather similar to where we started, it is a um, significant additional contribution. OK, so this supports then the idea that uh, phonological features are indeed an important ingredient in how speakers generalize to strings of segments. And note that the set of 88 words here actually didn't have that many words like nick. It had a few, like shwooj. Uh, shwooj is a very mild nick word. There aren't any shwas. Uh, um, but uh, there aren't that many words like that in here. So this is not a very good test of features. The fact that there's any effect even in these is um, kind of um, uh, impressive. So this supports then the idea that uh, features are uh, a useful tool, and now we want to use them to do what we um, called them out for in the first place. So we wanted to use features to generalize to unattested sequences, and so here I come back to the uh, data from Scholes. Uh, this was a test, it's very um, low-tech, but uh, this data has been used now in a few different um, studies of uh, um, onset clusters, so it's a kind of a benchmark uh, data set. Um, so uh, Scholes asked a group of room of seventh graders to uh, write down yes or no for um, whether certain words <coughs> could be uh, possible English words. There were things like plump or shvel or keep or jeanette. There were a lot of strange, this is where um, rum and rum came from. And uh, some words they always accepted, like stint or crumb. Others they always hated, like jameel or keep. And um, most of them were somewhere in the middle. And uh, so this is the uh, relative preferences that we want to explain. So I trained uh, these models, uh, again, on, um, uh, on English. And in this case, rather than using Telex, I used um, a different corpus, just because this is what uh, um, uh, Hayes and Wilson used in a study also modeling this data set. So um, I don't think this will be crucial. Um, I, so I, I trained the models on English, and then I tried to you, uh, get predictions for those uh, clusters, uh, crust, uh, la, la, ra, ta, and so on. And here are the results. First, and importantly, using the biograms can't even make predictions about differences among unattested clusters. That's why we started looking at the features in the first place. So it's not even able to tell you whether la should be better than ra. Um, on the attested clusters, both models do pretty well. So there's, uh, I'm giving here um, Kendall's towels as I'm not sure if they're agreement. Uh, so both models can get some of these crushes be better than blah, blah should be better than um, uh, blah, and so on. OK, so um, how do we interpret this? In order to see uh, 
what um, the relative merit of these different models was, I did a logistic regression testing the ability of each to predict these uh, numbers of yeses. So, they, so we asked the model to predict how many kids raised their hand. And uh, um, I did this separately for the attested clusters and the unattested clusters since the uh, um, Bigram, the, the, the segment model can't even make predictions about the attested clusters, and that might um, uh, cause some, uh, that might change the um, way the uh, model fits somehow. So among the attested clusters, that's the one where there's serious competition, they're actually both doing quite well. Um, it turns out that uh, either model alone, the really simple, how common is that, is that combination of segments, and the um, feature model, uh, both uh, have, are, are both significant predictors. However, um, if you put them in at once and let them fight it out, uh, the uh, segment model um, turns out to be um, completely uh, useless. Uh, it turns out that um, the, if you add the segment model first, you still need to add the feature model, but if you add the feature model first, you don't need the segment model. So um, there's an asymmetry there. So it looks like uh, then um, these, uh, uh, data are modeled appropriately, completely, by just using features to uh, generalize to the attested clusters. And we can put that side by side with the fact that the unattested clusters, that was the only one in the game. We, we had to use features to generalize to those. So uh, this is now 30 different ways of seeing that features seem to play an important role in modeling generalization to unseen clusters. That might seem kind of boring. I mean, there are tons of examples in the, there are tons of examples in um, the psychology literature of uh, feature-based generalization and ways of modeling feature-based generalization. But I think it uh, becomes more interesting when we turn to cases where it doesn't work. So uh, I wanted to go to some lengths to convince you that we have a model that's doing pretty well before uh, we see that it doesn't work. Okay, so now, where does it not work? So I started with this uh, preference for what over not over da over za. And this is often analyzed in the phonology literature as a sonority sequencing preference, a preference for a rise from the sonority of the bug, which is not a very sonorous segment, to the uh, sonority of wa, which is a very sonorous segment, no less sonorous in them is that not very sonorous. So this is the hierarchy that was the most and the, uh, the least. Um, that hierarchy is normally uh, defended on typological grounds based on um, the fact that uh, languages if a language allows da, they also allow no, or the, but not vice versa. Um, and in fact, uh, even for languages that don't allow either one, um, it has been shown in various ways that speakers do prefer no over da. So I collected a little bit um, more comprehensive data on this by uh, testing non-words, starting with um, <coughs> a large set of uh, P and B initial clusters, plug, 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 and so on. Um, and uh, I paired these with, so you have to play people words, you can't just play people a cluster. So I paired these with um, a controlled set of rhymes. There were words like um, knack and uh, zine and so on and so on. Um, now, uh, I actually embedded this in a task with many, many different pillars. So actually, uh, the number of words starting with things like none and zed are quite small. Um, people weren't aware they were comparing these. Um, and it turns out, so we have two kinds of data. One is, uh, how often do people repeat the word wrong? I made them repeat it before they rated it. And, how, and what do they rate it? And these two uh, types of evidence uh, go in lockstep. They frequently say them incorrectly. Well, frequently, 10% of the time they say it incorrectly. And they also don't like it. That word like yeah. back. So that uh, simply confirms what we would have expected on the typological grounds anyway, um, but shows that English speakers have um, uh, that knowledge as well, in spite of the fact that they don't know the typology, they just know English, which doesn't have any of them. Okay, so um, now the question is, can we use this model that uh, generalizes to na and to bwa to predict those preferences? So I trained the model on the set of English onsets, uh, um, back to Salex. Uh, and I had tried it two ways, just on onsets and on entire words. Again, um, testing <coughs> the idea that perhaps uh, medial what or nut is important in uh, modeling the preference. And we get essentially the same results either way. There's a lot more support in English for nut than there is for what. <coughs> um, 
but that's not what people prefer. So that is then the discrepancy, the um, this preference for uh, what by the model, but the preference for what by the model. So just to show you this more explicitly, well, I don't, it's a lot of symbols and we don't need to go through. Predicted the preference for bna over the other respectively, but not the boy over the Okay, well, that is sort of a negative result. It just shows the model didn't work on something. Um, but uh, we have to remember the model does work on an awful lot. So that's um, at least a reason to uh, take that seriously. And uh, um, uh, the other reason to take it seriously is that if we look at the specific failing of the model, the failure to uh, prefer bwa over bna, this turns out to be a very interpretable failure. It's the interpretation is exactly what we started with. It's the uh, preference to have a more sonorous segment here. So uh, the requirement can be stated extremely simply. Stops have to be followed by sounds which provide clear bursts in form and structure. So a very sonorous segment. Um, now, uh, this could be, uh, yeah, so I, this could be stated in terms of two separate restrictions. You want to have something which clearly gives you a burst after, you know, the butt, the, the, the butt and the informant transitions, or uh, uh, maybe these are together. I'm going to uh, simply uh, state them as a single constraint, which says a stop wants to be followed by something which is strongly voiced. And that's going to provide both of those things. The, uh, um, <coughs> the uh, clean break where the burst is very uh, distinct and the form of um, We also uh, do not want to have combinations where the form of transitions are obscured for some reason. So the sound is voiced, but the form of transitions are obscured because the formants, uh, the, the segment that's providing the formants has its own uh, wishes <laughs> for the formants. So in the sequence, what? The what allows you to hear that the lip just opened, but the what makes you keep your lips closed. So it's not letting you have the transitions from the but that uh, give you a good cue that there was a but there. Okay, so that's what I mean by an antagonistic target in the sound, so the sound itself. So we want uh, sounds that are strongly voiced and don't interfere with the form and transitions by uh, providing an independent place to be. So um, I'll just treat these as uh, independent requirements. There's a requirement for sonority, and uh, I will say that a uh, stop followed by an obstruent violates that muchissimo. <laughs> and uh, a uh, stop followed by a glide is a very minor violation of that. Um, and uh, we could have done it otherwise. So the hierarchy, just as a matter of a scale, one, two, three, four, so we could have done one violation, two violations, three violations, four violations. We're going to see this actually does much better. The, build in the phonetic characterization. And we want a constraint against the non-antagonistic place combinations. So these, this would be the analysis that would make sense of the preference that speakers have, uh, namely, why do they like what? Well, because it uh, fares well with respect to this constraint. Why don't they have what already? Well, I mean, it does have some problems. It's not perfect. So in order to uh, test this, uh, um, I started uh, with the, the statistical models, the model I showed you here, which wasn't doing so well. And now you can see really how not well it was doing. That is the uh, predictions for individual words. Um, that's uh, um, rather different from what we saw from just kind of the arbitrary words. Uh, and uh, based only on sonority, we get um, the model based on sonority will say that uh, words should be bad by uh, score seven, six, two, and one, you know, the violations I had there. So there's a small number of possible values that a word could have according to that constraint. And so here we have all of the no, no words, all the to, to, um, here the flood and pra, and here the what. Okay. So just phonetics would, would, would predict that the pho word should be great and the zo word should be bad, the statistics <coughs> map, if we put them together, things get better. So, <laughs> the, uh, um, so I uh, tried to determine the, rel to the, the relative contribution of these and put them into a single model by using a generalized linear model. 
Um, and uh, when we add the two, the um, sonority constraint and the uh, statistical constraints, suddenly things start looking better. We're getting better. Um, so this, uh, all this did was took these and moved them left and right according to the sonority. And now if we add the antagonistic place constraint, that takes care of almost everything. That's almost a complete model. Not bad. <laughs> okay, so uh, what's um, I think interesting about this, other than the sort of satisfaction of occasionally getting things to fall in a line, is that uh, the um, it actually gave some support for a very specific hypothesis about how the relevant constraint should be formulated. In particular, the um, constraint that got us here was this one with this big hole in the middle that made a big difference between bra and no. That makes a lot of sense on phonetic grounds, um, but it's not a logical necessity that the phonological constraint had been formulated that way. So uh, this is a, a, a kind of evidence we couldn't have gotten just from the typology, um, that it looks like the constraint is sensitive not only to the difference, but to the magnitude of the difference. Um, OK, so uh, that jump then the, um, uh, between Bonnet and Blatt is what is modeled well. And I didn't show um, how much worse it is if you only do it uh, incrementally, but it is worse. So this is a very direct way of uh, providing a quantitative score for how much better one formulation of the constraint is than the other. Um, not something we often have in technology. Um, for what it's worth, actually, it turns out that the, um, these phonetically grounded constraints are doing most of the heavy lifting data, but um, we don't need to. I don't know that it matters which was the more important figure here. The fact is that they were both significant and we can observe the rules of each. Okay, so that was the um, second and I guess most important uh, um, case that I wanted to uh, show you uh, where we see a discrepancy between the rating that people give to these nonce words and uh, the uh, statistics that we would get just by calculating co-occurrence of probability. So the uh, approach is to add phonetic factors together with um, the statistical model. There are also other ways of doing this, like um, make the statistical model know about phonetics. Um, that would be another path. Okay, I want to show you just very briefly another um, area I've been exploring where we get a difference between the statistics of English and the judgments that people have. Um, this is one that I have less quantitative data and less of a formal model of, but I think it's a completely fascinating phenomenon that, um, and newly described property of English, so I wanted to uh, um, simply uh, tell you about it. Um, and it concerns words that have more than one cluster in them, words like crisp or spark or salt. Um, now, it turns out that there's a surprising difference between combinations of clusters. Sometimes, a cluster combination is very acceptable. Words like trink are quite acceptable as possible English words. Words like crast are quite acceptable. Um, however, other combinations are quite odd. Words like thrust, or words like plisk, or words like snalt. Snalt is actually um, historically funny. I personally uh, find it very, very strange. Um, uh, there are no words like smalls, and uh, people find them very odd. So, the, uh, so this is going to be the um, contrast that we have to try to derive. On the one hand, the models that we've discussed so far treat the probability of the word as simply a consequence of the combination of its parts. So you have this part, and you multiply you know, the probability of this part multiplied by the probability of that part multiplied by the probability of that part. However, we're going to see that there are cases where the combination is worse than that expected combination. And we want to know why that sometimes happens. And I call it the super additivity. I think it's been called this before by others. So when do you get super additivity? Um, so let me just show you one example where you don't get it and one example where you do get it. Um, so uh, if you look at uh, um, words that end in S stop clusters, words um, like tusk, um, or uh, best. Um, it turns out that, uh, so here I show the number of words that end in stop and consonants other than S, words that end in S, and words that end in a combination. 
And it turns out that there aren't very many words like fast. There's a lot more words like fast. Um, but uh, if you add up all the stuh words and the spa words and the stuh words and so on, um, all together, they're about as frequent as the S words. So there are about as many S stop words as there are S words as S stop altogether compared to S. And the same is true for L. There's about as many um, milk and um, belt words as there are milk words. Belt words. Uh, so they're about the same. There's you know, small differences, but they're, they're actually pretty in lockstep. Um, so there uh, we see that uh, this gives us a kind of baseline estimate of how often do we expect S stop clusters to occur and L stop clusters to occur, namely about as often as the Ls and the Ss. Now, if we uh, look, um, ah, and here instead of Ls. Okay, so if we look at uh, words that start with um, these clusters, so this will be, look at the S side, this will be words like brisk and words like crest um, and trust. It turns out that here, although there are a few differences, they are indeed about as often. Too. Um, not very many data points to go on here, but uh, they're about as frequent. And the um, same thing is sort of seen here, although there are somewhat fewer for some of these combinations. There are some combinations. Uh, so the what um, I want you to take from this, although when you look at sixes, fives, and threes, it's not obvious. There's no significant difference by Fish's exact test between the uh, um, number of times you get uh, the n stop clusters or the s stop clusters in a symbol of n methods. And that is in line with what we saw when there's no cluster. Okay, so there's a few that happen to be missing. I don't know why there aren't very many front words. There just aren't. <laughs> but those are relatively limited in scope. Where uh, things are much clearer are with um, the uh, uh, are with um, other concept clusters. So, Reminder, these guys are roughly the same. These are much less so in between here. So here, this is kind of like the um, brunch uh, comparison. But if you see here, they're actually as consistent all the way down. There are no drist, dressed, thrust, drist, thrust, thrust. There are none of these words. Drist, dressed, none. It's a, it's a big hole in the English lexicon, actually. Um, and uh, um, uh, it's not something about uh, these clusters can't, that these clusters can't co-occur with other clusters. We've seen they can. So what do, why should these two interact in this way? Okay. Uh, and they sound really weird. Um, okay. uh, saving all this. Um, uh, they sound weird, and the confirmation they sound weird comes from this study by Bailey and Hahn, where they actually ask people to rate some words like rust or drugged or snulp, um, and people really hate them. Salt, uh, snip. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that gives us some reason to believe that that's not just a hole in the English lexicon. People really do hate these words. Um, I'm trying to follow up on this right now to really show it a little better. So I uh, just uh, so I can stop talking. Uh, let me um, uh, zoom ahead and say, okay. So why is that interesting? I showed you there's a hole in the English lexicon. People don't like words in that hole. I mean, there's, people just know there's a hole in the English lexicon, and so uh, therefore there's no statistical support for it. Those combinations are rare, and people don't like them. End of story. That's what statistical learning is for. I don't think it's as easy as that. Um, in fact, most of the combinations we've discussed, like Stin and Leif and so on, are uh, relatively under-attested combinations. That's how I was able to make those nonce words. They were missing holes from where those words were. Um, it is normally not the case that a rare combination of the beginning of the word and the end of the word dooms the word. <coughs> that doesn't appear to be a statistic people keep track of. Uh, words like wis, there actually aren't any wis combination words either, but that doesn't make wis sound bad. So it can't be the lack of dris words that makes dris sound bad either. Um, but the more important reason to think that uh, it's not something that's just arbitrarily learned is that I think we can actually predict when this happens. And to show you this, let me, uh, so here I put the, uh, um, some of the more common clusters of English, and they're sort of decreasing in frequency. These are the onset clusters. Stun are quite common, stun and what are rare. Final stun and unk are common. 
um, and the final uh, oomph book, book are rare. And now, the clusters that are um, uh, that co-occur as often as expected are generally the high frequency ones. The ones that occur less often than expected are the kind of middle and low frequency ones. Um, so that it's not perfect, actually. Gura seems to not occur as often, but I mean, maybe uh, that maybe people won't actually obey that. I don't know. So it looks like there's a relation between frequency. Well, why should that be? So why should two very frequent things sound perfect and two very infrequent things sound even worse than their infre unfrequency, infrequency, unfrequency would uh, <laughs> predict? <laughs> um, well, here's an idea. Suppose that uh, what we're seeing here is the um, effect of two levels of evaluation. There is a statistical evaluation of the probability of the combination of sounds. That's always, you always um, evaluate the probability of the combination. And so those very frequent combinations occur about as often as you'd expect. But suppose that uh, for the um, lower guys, the grammar actually doesn't like them. So the grammar is fine with all of these and doesn't make any distinctions. The grammar doesn't like these very much. And suppose what we're seeing then is that uh, we're getting two layers of effect. The combination of dispreferred things is low probability, and that is even further attenuated by the grammar, the grammatical evaluation. Okay. So this is one way I'm trying to make sense of this uh, difference. So uh, the somewhat uncommon clusters, that's where the grammar starts saying something, and that's where you start getting these super additive effects. And the super additive effect is two levels of evaluation, what the probability says and what the grammaticality evaluation says. And these are both playing a role in shaping people's intuition about it. Now, there's no, just from the fact that there's, um, you know, English is missing some words, there's no proof of this, but this is a, a, this is a story that's consistent with what we've been finding so far, that there are two modes of evaluation. And if you think how would they interact in producing a uh, intuition about acceptability? This would be an effect you might expect. Okay, so then uh, what we would say is that a word like um, stimp, uh, the grammar says nothing about it if you ask people to judge it. They know the probability of the two parts, and they tell you it's done, they have their own probabilities, and that gives us a score. A somewhat uncommon cluster like snalt, sna is not that probable, ult is not that probable. Sna is not that good, and ult is not that good. And that is uh, the two parts of the super additivity. Now, the really rare one is like wolf. The grammar should care about it too, and the probabilities care about it too. But let's say it's Wills. Uh, <laughs> um, Wills is already so bad just on the basis of half of it alone. And it's very hard. I mean, there's no, there are so few flow words that it's hard to know whether the Wills words are particularly underrepresented uh, um, given the flow. It's possible that ratings data might show that uh, it's like you get hyper additivity effects for these or something. Okay, so then there's these three cases. So uh, it turns out that this too has an interesting lesson for phonological theory because it's not the case that uh, standard phonological modes of constraint interaction like um, optimality theory can penalize a form for having two clusters like this. It's just not something optimality theory can do. But that's, I guess, sort of a topic for a different talk. Um, I'm currently working on how you could devise a constraint model that would actually manage to capture the grammatical effect we need to get the hyperhetic, the superadditivity. Okay. So um, then uh, to conclude, so that's uh, the, the least models that I think kind of the most uh, interesting in a way of these effects, the kind of payoff of uh, actually managing to parcel out the um, sources of uh, knowledge that might influence these tasks. Um, but more generally, I've tried to show you kind of three different ways that um, I'm observing that these uh, rating values, uh, that these acceptability ratings um, deviate from the statistics that we get from a baseline model, and uh, in ways that we can interpret, namely that they're uh, um, due to the uh, influence of trying to understand the feature combinations embodied in the word, or uh, evaluate the phonetic uh, properties of the um, combination of sounds in the word, or uh, perhaps um, do multiple levels of processing on the word. And it's plausible, plausible partly because it's just familiar labels to call this grammar, because these are the kinds of things grammar look like. And so 
let's call it that. Let's say that uh, um, this is the effect of the phonological grammar and evaluation of the representations um, uh, using features and incorporating biases for some segments over others and uh, um, with penalties that aren't simply a product of the uh, statistics. 